Okay, then uh, I will share my screen in a minute. Mm. Today, uh, we are going to discuss uh, Can you guys see the screen? Can you? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, so let's start uh, today's topic. Uh, it's about uh, statistical engineering lesson five logistic regression. Huh? So in the last week, uh, we were discussing about uh, wait a minute, uh, want to hide this. Uh, minute. You can see, right? Okay. Okay. Uh, here we are going to discuss about the logistic regression. Right? It is an extension of linear regression. Right. Uh, if you guys have any questions about linear regression, uh, which are not yet clear, uh, you can ask me so that uh, we will not get stuck inside the today's lesson. Okay. So before we start with the logistic regression, because it is an extension of the from the linear regression, if you guys have any questions and uh, un some unclear sections in the linear regression, uh, let me know. Right. So the gradient descent that we have covered in the the, yes, the last week lesson is not that relevant, right? So it is relevant, but uh, it's not directly required to. I learned the today's lesson, right? So that is a different separate algorithm, right? So we just got to know because uh, it is required to know about that gradient descent algorithm for learning the machine learning, right? So the main theoretical part uh, that is dependent, that is, uh, which is a dependent for today's lesson is the linear regression, right? Uh, if you have any questions you can ask now before we start it the linear regression you can ask you can unmute and ask directly if you have any questions some unclear sections with uh, linear regression because this is an extension of that linear regression right Okay, uh, if you have any questions, you can uh, interrupt and ask, okay? So, in the linear regression, what we have learned uh, was a regression algorithm. So, in the regression algorithm, what are regression algorithms? Regression means that uh, it's a supervised learning algorithm where you, your y variable or the dependent variable is a continuous one, right? That means we are going to uh, or predict the continuous variable, right? something like we are uh, predicting the height of a person kind of thing. Right? Uh, so that based on certain uh, nationality, age, uh, race, uh, nutrition level or something, so we can estimate the person's height. That kind of uh, model is known as a regression model. right? So that is a regression means we we are going to predict a continuous variable. We are going to predict a value for a particular continuous variable in the regression. 
with regression in the today's lesson we are going to do something different which is about classification right so what is a classification so in the classification you know it right so the for the dependent variable or the y variable we can have a uh, few discrete categories or classes right so what you are going to do with uh, classification is that uh, we are given the x variable we are going to predict the class or the category uh, of that particular data point right uh, so in that case uh, in the classification our y variable is a uh, integer right a small countable integer right uh, so what the, that means that particular integer will represent which uh, what is the class that the uh, that particular data point belongs right so when you have only two classes we call it as binary classification and when there are more than two classes we call it as uh, normal ordinary classification or multiple classification problem right so the today's lesson which is a logistic regression is a, is also a regression but it can uh, lead to a classification so lead to solving a classification problem so that is the advantage of using logistic regression so this is an extension of linear regression so in the linear regression we have uh, can if you can remember right mm. for example we have say uh, different uh, x variables like x1 x2 x3 right and they are multiplied by some coefficients so beta 1 beta 2 and beta 3 and there is another uh, so we we multiply x1 with beta 1 and add it right we take the sum of them that's why i added as sigma right we multiply x2 with beta 2 x3 with beta 3 and we add a bias term known as beta 0 right and then we get the output which is the y variable right? this is the linear regression if we draw it as a diagram this is how we can draw it right? actually we haven't discussed it in this way because uh, uh, actually if this is this representation is very useful when you are learning uh, neural networks right this is actually how a neural network is represented right so this is the very basic form of a uh, neuron actually so that is why it is very important to understand the linear regression and logistic regression right so if you now you know right uh, what is a linear regression so we have a beta zero or we we can say it as uh, we multiply with beta zero with uh, x variable which which is we call it as x zero uh, which is equal to one right we can take x zero as one and so because we want to calculate the uh, beta t x dot product right so this one gives the value of this y variable right that is how we predict the values for y right when, when you're calculating this beta beta vector so we take it as beta transpose vector because we are going to take the dot product right uh, we, when we calculate the beta vector what is the what consists of beta vector beta vector is beta 0 beta 1 beta 2 beta 3 or beta n right uh, when it comes to the x vector it is it consists of uh, so we, because there is a bias we we have, have one x0 which is equal to 1 and x1 x2 x3 and then we take the dot product and this is how we predict the value for one. so 
with the fitting a hyperplane or in the case of uh, simple linear regression fitting a straight line uh, which it is defined by this beta vector we can find the form find the solution for the linear regression right so this finding the linear regression is finding a solution for the linear regression is finding the values for this beta vector right so we yeah. so our data set is the x data set and by giving different different values for these x values and the, because this is a supervised pro learning problem we for each of the x for x1 x2 x3 for all the data points we have y values for each of the data point and with these uh, these uh, x values and y values we are going to predict a value for predict values for beta 0 beta and beta n right which is the value that is the uh, coefficient vector or the beta vector and this beta vector represents the linear regression linear regression hyperplane right? so that is what we do in linear regression so we have discussed that how we are going to find the hyperplane we are going to find the hyperplane by uh, finding the uh, least MSEs. MSE means mean square errors from x values to the hyperplane, right? Like this, right? Okay, you can remember, right? So from the data points are not uh, on the exact linear model, but uh, there are some differences, right? So each of these data point introduces some error. So we calculate the mean square error for all of them. Sorry, square, we calculated the square errors for all of them, and then we take the mean, which is uh, which is the mean square errors, right? So, with the gradient descent algorithm, we can find uh, which is an, using an iterative method using the gradient descent algorithm. We find the uh, straight line. We find the beta values for the straight line or the high plane. Where the mean square errors are minimized. Right? That is all what we do in linear regression. Right? Nothing uh, so serious. If you think uh, it is very difficult, there's nothing very difficult. It is very simple. Right? In today's lesson, what we are going to do is we are going to introduce another. Actually, so when we when I say this, uh, today's lesson is finished, right? So, don't worry, right? So, suppose that uh, instead of get directly getting the y value from here, we add another function known as the uh, activation function, right? From there, we can predict the y value. So this activation function uh, in today's lesson is known as the logistic function. This is the logistic function, right? So this one, you know, right? This one is in this point, it is like it is a linear relationship, right? It's a linear hyperplane, right? Which is beta t x, x from the b from the, when each of the x values are multiplied with beta values, we get the hyperplane, which is which is represented in by a uh, flat surface in two D space. So in in multiple uh, dimensions, we can represent it as a linear hyperplane. Right. So we in this in today's lesson, we are going to introduce some non-linearity into this 2D space so that uh, this would be something like uh, something like this. Y X should be the 1. This is 0. Sorry. Uh, 
so this is there are some issue right so i will draw it again right so it's, it's it would be like this y x it would not go to the one but this is zero this is zero point five this is known as the logistic function so once we get the multiplication of uh, x y values and the beta values we get this hyperplane at this point and then we apply before we get the y values we apply this nonlinear uh, function is known as the logistic function and it would result a y value where you can see right so in the earlier case uh, it was like uh, in the earlier case it may be something like This is a straight line, right? So, should be a straight line. But uh, once we have applied this uh, sigmoid function, this so sorry, this uh, logistic function, the values of y will lie between one and zero. So, why we are doing it? How how we come to this solution? We are going to learn in the today's lesson. So don't worry why what we are going to do here, right? Okay, so keeping uh, just forget it. So why just don't worry why we are doing it. This is all what we are going to learn today. What we are going to do with uh, logistic regression. So just uh, forgetting all these things. So we will start uh, from the primitives. So. When you when uh, like uh, when we are predicting the y variables uh, in the regression, we have a continuous variable, right? So the y when y, y is a continuous variable, we call it as a regression. If y is a uh, categorical variable or discrete, it has a discrete value like color age, this is known as classification, right? And so what we are going to do with uh, regression is so with the classification is that we are going to make a model so that it can predict the class uh, based on the values of x. Right? So when you are given when you are given some different x features, and uh, when we find that uh, this particular uh, x feature uh, are relevant to that particular class, that if we can predict it, that's what we want is classification. And there are two classes. And there are only two classes, we call it as binary classification. And for the when we so uh, it, in today's lesson, we are mainly focusing about this binary classification, right? So in binary classification means we, we have two values, so right. So in when for the, these two values, uh, we call it as a, we call it with the values relevant to the binary numbers, right? In the binary, so that means Boolean values, there are only two values, right? True and false, or positive or negative, right? So sometimes we define all these two numbers as uh, one or zero, one for true or the positive, and zero for false or negative. So, for example, uh, if you want to predict, uh, uh, in this example, right? So, predicting the person's gender either male or female by testosterone concentration in blood, height and bone density. So these using these factors, you can make, you may be able to uh, build a model. So where you can uh, for predict the uh, a person's gender. Right? So for example, in forensic uh, requirement or some other. So for example, uh, suppose you we have found another alien from a spaceship so uh, you want to find whether that uh, alien is a male or a female 
so you can uh, find their testosterone level and bone density and height and you can uh, predict whether that alien is a male or a female right? and actually you can't write so because we collect the data from our distribution right? human distribution and we are going to apply it to aliens that won't work but uh, we can do something like that right? <laughs> uh, so here for example if you are going to uh, take male and female values for the binary values uh, we may call uh, one of the values as true and one of the values we can take one of the values as true or one values or other value as the false value. like uh, we can take male value as true or female value as false or female value as uh, one true uh, one female values as false or something like that so there's no particular reason why you select uh, true for male and for or true female for true or something like that right? so so either whatever the point you can take it as true or positive value or the one value and take the other one as the negative or the false or the zero value right? so like uh, when when you are classifying a cancer whether it is a innocent cancer or if there is a cancer which is known as malignant or it is a benign or an innocent cancer in innocent tumor like which is not a cancer right? so you can also give it as, as zero or one in this kind of scenario easy we can easily take it as uh, the cancer cases as one the true and uh, take the other case as uh, false or zero or negative right uh, but when it comes to a case like gender still you have to use one of these uh, names just for the purpose of classification right there's nothing there's no value in related to one and zero when it comes to this binary classification so let's take this example right so this is uh, where we have that kind of classification problem right for different x values where yeah, x is suppose this x is the size of the tumor right size of the tumor and with size of the tumor they have they have collected some data sets and found that uh, after a certain size of the uh, after a certain size of a tumor it is a it's usually a malignant or it's a, it's a cancer right we when the size is lesser than that is generally a, a innocent tumor a benign one right? so how we are going to uh, forecast this pre predict a new tumor by its size uh, using this data set so what what comes into your mind is using linear regression right so what you can do is you can uh, build the model which is this is the linear regression classifier right this is the linear regression classifier and you can uh, when you train your linear regression model using gradient descent you will get a hyperplane in this case it is a uh, straight line right? uh, like this so in order to classify these two uh, malignant and benign we can use this point which is 0.5 right this is an example right so if the uh, y value is uh, the that means the value predicted by the linear regression is higher than 0.5 we can consider that as the mass malignant uh, if the the linear regression classifier classifies some points uh, that are lesser than 0.5 we can call them as benign or innocent right so with our existing knowledge we can make a model like this and this would work right so if another data point comes like uh, for example somewhere here it can be predicted that this is a malignant tumor right if it goes somewhere here it is a benign because uh, that value is uh, somewhere here, which is 
lesser than 0.5 because because of that this is benign or innocent right? okay now take this example right now your data set has not only these three suppose you your data set not only consists of these three data points and there's another data point so now when you train your classifier linear regression classifier it will be like this because uh, the linear regression classifier will try to uh, fit all the data points right given giving equal weight right so these data points are also given the same uh, priority that from as same as the this data points right these data points are also given the same weight and this or the this data point because this data point is uh, located somewhere too far away from these data points so this linear regression line will be shifted from here to from here to here right in the earlier case it was here now it is there right now what happens is that uh, if you take the same uh, 0.5 value it would be not working right so if you take the, the 0.5 value when you are going to classify uh, if you take these examples oh, these values they are misclassified that means they are not classified as uh, malignant tumors they will be classified as benign because uh, these values so when you come to this data point it would be relevant to uh, these values right because of that uh, they will be classified as benign this is also lesser than 0.5 this is also lesser than 0.5 so they will be pointed to benign region pointed to the benign region so they will be considered as benign but it is not right so what happened was the problem was created when we added this new data point the problem with this uh, uh, classification is that uh, the linear regression classifier right this line treats all the data points the same right all the data points the same although uh, how much they are uh, located apart right? but in reality because these are two categories uh, we don't have to th uh, think about the x value right so that means once the x value exceeds a certain point somewhere like here whatever the x value the data point takes you should not take that seriously right? so with once the data point was after this particular x value actually so that means how we when we are creating a model that is the how the model should think right so the model should understand that if the value is greater than x uh, how much how long you how much x value you have with that particular data point it should be belong it should belong to the malignant right and how much uh, what whatever the value x has the x may be somewhere here right in this line but still this should be we don't need to think about the x value but this should be a benign one. So we should not uh, take the linear combination, linear distances uh, between these two. We just need to identify what is the point where this value, these values, and these values are separated. Right? So, the, but the the regression, the this classification problem has to identify is to identify the, the point where these are uh, these classes are separated right not the like the mean value of each of these class each of these data points and make a line out of them so that uh, it would be uh, misclassifying 
So it is not it is giving some effect that it, that is not required right? because of this uh, this property. So this has created this this misclassifications. Right? So we need to have some other function instead of linear regression. So this is what we should have, right? So now look at this green line. This green line is what we really want. Uh, if this point is greater than this particular number, this x value, it should be having a specified dash malignant. Otherwise, if it is less, lesser than this particular point, uh, it would be considered as benign. That is exactly what we want. Right? So this is known as the unit step function. Uh, not the unit exact unit step function, which is uh, which is uh, where the this point is located at this point. So this is a variation of unit step function. Where you can see there is a there is a right angle between uh, this uh, from the horizontal axis from the beginning and the end of this unit step function. Right. So there is a sudden change happens at this point. Now the problem is because of this sudden change at this point, this function, this green function, the unit step function is not differentiable. So what does that mean, right? So when a function, so this green line is represented by, is, is a function right function means it's a relationship so a function so that is a mathematical theory right so a function is differentiable differentiable means it can be uh, you can find the slope of a function right so find in the last week we were discussing about in the difference in this gradient descent right so we talked about differentiation but i said that no need to uh, learn about if you don't understand about this uh, calculus or differentiation don't worry right so today also you don't have to worry so what i'm going to say is that at this particular point uh, the eyes so you the eyes you can't find the gradient or the slope at this particular point right you can find the differentiation at this particular point that means you can find the slope at this point so in all the other points, the slope is zero, right? So slope is zero means uh, when you try, for example, if you try to draw a, a touching line at this point, it is like this. So in this point, there is no uh, increment or decrement. So that means this line is parallel to the x-axis. Because of this, this line has the slope of zero. Uh, in, in this point also, it is the gradient is or the slope is zero. But throughout this line from here to here, it is zero. From here to here also, from here to what, whatever the point, it is also zero. But from here to here, you can't define, right? So this small distance, uh, because there is a huge difference that happens in between these two points, you, can, you can't define what is the slope uh, in between these two points. So this is a very small data, small distance, right? So we call it as a very negligible distance. With this distance, you can't define with what is the slope of this function. Actually, this is slope is like infinite, right? So infinite, you can't uh, calculate it, right? But you can't, actually, this is, we don't call it as infinity. We call it as uh, not uh, defined because of that because the slope cannot be defined in this particular point uh, you can't use gradient descent for this unit step function this screen for this screen function you can't apply gradient descent algorithm that is the problem right? uh, in the last week we were discussing that uh, in order to find the optimum solution uh, we are uh, moving through the uh, when we have a curve or something, 
uh, we move from here to here and here to here and so on through the curve uh, through that gradient right so if somewhere you can, you find some nasty uh, spike like this we are the uh, this uh, gradient cannot be defined then you can't uh, move from here right you have to stop here because uh, in, at this particular point this uh, slope is not defined the same thing has happened here because the gradient is not defined you can't use this function because there's an infinite gradient because of that, you can't use this. Unfortunately, you can't use this uh, unit step functions variant, right? Variant of unit step function, which is represented by green line, cannot be used for gradient descent. Because of that, we have to use an approximate uh, continuous function instead of this unit step function. This is, so what is the difference between the earlier one and this one? Uh, this one is, uh, this one has a smooth curve, right? Instead of a uh, very 90 degree uh, uh, difference angle between the uh, curve and the x-axis. This one has a smooth change, a smooth curve. Uh, yeah, you can actually use the gradient descent. It can move from here to here, from here to here, and so on, uh, without having undefined point. So when you consider the, this new green line, this the grade, the slope is defined in all the points, right? So this should not uh, exactly when you come to the top, it would not easily come to the top. It would take very long uh, x values to move to the exact one point, and this would also not move to the move to zero at once, right? Like in the earlier function, right? So it should not exactly go to the one and keep it at one at, in all the time, and not move to zero and keep moving they are in zero point but it would take infinite long time to come to touch to this uh, x-axis and here or oh, the same thing will happen right because of this this green line is said to be continuous and it is differentiable because it or oh, in other words in simple term they are said the slope is defined in all the points of this green line. Because of that, you can apply the gradient descent algorithm for this uh, new green line. Right? So because of this reason, uh, instead of this green line, we can use unit step function, you can use this new green curve, right? which is an approximation for this unit step function area. Right. Because of this, now this is so. Now this is now they here. What we can do is instead of using this linear regression, uh, earlier we tried to use the this unit step function to predict it. So this unit step function easily contains two classes. After this point, you have one value. Before this point, we have zero values. Because of this, uh, this unit step function is a pure classification, uh, pure classifier, right? But when it comes to this function, this function doesn't have any particular ones or zeros, but it uh, varies in between one and the zero. Because of that, it is actually a regression line, right? not a classification, uh, not a classifier, but uh, it's, it's a regressor because it is a continuous function. And all the points, in all the points, the slope is defined. Defined means it is not going to infinity at any point of point in this function. Right? 
this is actually the logistic function also known as the sigmoid function actually not the not this exact function right so from here the zero is here right but uh, the exact logistic function is almost the same we are the only difference is that uh, uh, so here we have to selected Z, right? So, so, so you will understand why we are using X. Uh, we are using Z instead of X, right? So we are going to use the values uh, used in the linear regression as Z, right? So for example, you can take Z dash beta t x, right? So that is uh, why we are not not using x but we are using z values right so in the at the beginning we said that we are using this activation function right so from here the value is beta t x so this is the this is the logistic or the sigmoid function right we should introduce this nonlinearity right which i have so this function is actually this the original pure logistic function uh, cuts the y-axis or in, in in this case the z axis right sorry uh, sorry if f, f is x, x axis right f z axis at point five, right? And it would not touch one, and it would touch the one at infinity, and it would touch the zero at negative infinity. So the curve would be like this. Right? So this is the logistic function or the sigmoid function. So uh, just uh, understand it, right? So this is the zero and this is positive value. These are positive values. These are negative values. Minus two, minus four. These are plus two, plus four. And this is the zero point. And this is the zero point five. This is one, right? Sigmoid function is that we start from negative infinity and it suddenly uh, raises its value and cross the if it is at x-axis exactly at the point 5, exactly at point 5, and would reach the one point, the one the value of 1, and it would saturate, and it would actually touch the 1 at infinity. Right? So, But that is not a problem. This is almost closer to the value of 1. This is almost close to the value of zero. Right? So the sudden changes of values between zero and one happens when the Z value is near the zero, right? So when this goes here, the values of F Z is reducing suddenly. When it is increasing the Z values, after the zero, the values of FPZ is uh, happening in a high rate, right? But after some time, they will be saturated and will move to, will go to one. When it is reduced, it will go to zero, right? That is the nature of this logistic function. So this logistic function is represented by this formula. F Z is 1 over 1 plus e to the power minus Z. So Z is the x axis, right? The y axis is F Z, right? So why we have selected Z instead of x? Because uh, our Z is already defined by x. That is a different reason, right? But uh, this is the formula, right? So because we have defined with Z, we can easily. In future, we can uh, define how this logistic logistic regression works.
but now you can see when they said is zero, if you said this point five, this point, and the F we said lies between zero and one, right? In between these two points. So it will never go be below the zero value. Actually, it will never go to zero and it would ne never go to one and it will never move above one as well, right? From minus infinity to plus, plus infinity, the values will be like in between zero and one. Unlike this, uh, the linear regression, right? So which is something like uh, something like this. In the case of linear regression, what we have learned, so this is for basically the simple linear regression, right? But uh, this logistic function is, is a highly nonlinear function. Nonlinear means when the z values are changing, at certain points, the z values are, uh, if, if the uh, if we said this changing highly, but at, at certain values, the so if we said this not get, getting almost changed, right? It is almost never changed. So that is why we call it as a nonlinear function. So this is a continuous alternative for the unit step function that we have defined before. The unit step function was like this, right? Except at the zero, it would go to one and it would continue at one. So this is not what we are going to use. So we are going to use this sigmoid function for the logistic regression, right? So now we have said that uh, we define, we said dash beta t x, where the beta dx is what we come up with the linear regression, right? This is its mathematical representation. He right? said we defined it as like linear regression. We say that he said this beta zero plus beta on x one, beta two x two plus beta n x n. This you know it, right? You know this is how you instead of he said if you had y. You know it is uh, linear regression, right? So in this case, we don't use y, we use e z, and then we apply that this e z into this logistic function or the sigmoid function, and you will get this function. Right? This is the logistic regression relationship. So this is not a hyperplane, right? So hyperplane, the linear hyperplane is defined by this, only with this relationship, right? But this one defines something else, right? So this one can be, uh, wait a minute, can be represented in, in the vector format like this. 1 over 1 plus e to the power minus. So this term, you, you know it, right? So this term can be represented as beta tx, beta transpose x. So this is the vector representation of logistic regression. Right? So you know it, right? So beta 0 is beta 0 x1, where x0 is 1. Right? This is the function of linear of sorry logistic regression. Now you know it, right? So we use logistic regression for binary classification. Right? So we have earlier what we are going to do is we are going to find a uh, find a solution for this malignant and benign problem, which is a binary classification problem. Right? So in this case we apply the logistic regression for binary classification. So, so now you know what is fx, right? What is fx? fx is 1 over 1 plus e to the power beta tx, which is beta 0, beta 1, x1, beta 2, x2, plus beta n, x, n, right? 
this is the fx so when fx is uh, now what we are going to do is we are going to predict the uh, values for uh, fx right so actually although these uh, these values are like uh, continuous right so if you take the screen line these values are continuous but what we want is whether these are one or zero right so when these values are uh, high or greater than 0.5 we we can consider them as malignant they are, if, when they are lesser than 0.5 we can consider them as benign so using this green line the logistic regression line we can predict these two classes one or zero or positive or negative right so we said that uh, for binary classification we can have two classes uh, named as one or positive class for one and zero or negative class for the other class right so if if fx is one uh, so how, how we take fx as one we take uh, if fx is greater than or, or equal to 0.5 we take take it as one if fx is lesser than 0.5 we take it as zero or negative right so it is like this huh? we take this point and if, if the y is lesser than 0.5 we take it as negative cases it is greater than uh, 0.5 we take it as positive cases that is how you take it that is how we define the define how we val predict values from this logistic regression formula right so we can further describe it as if it is positive or fx is greater than 0.5 we, so this is the vector format of uh, logistic regression so if, if fx is greater than or equal to 0.5 so this is fx so this one should also be greater than or equal to 0.5 okay. so when this one is greater than or equal to 0.5 mathematically you can understand that beta tx is greater than or equal to 0 understand it so when this value is greater than 0.5 this value is greater than zero right it's greater than or equal to 0.5 this is greater than or equal to zero why is that when uh, when only when this beta t beta transpose x is greater than zero right then this value will be uh, e to the pow uh, power minus value would be greater than uh, it is a positive one right this value will be positive that means e to the power minus three would be a, this one this term would be a would be greater than one, right? So sorry, lesser than one, right? So in this, this case, this whole value would be greater than one, right? Greater than point five, right? This one is greater than one, lesser lesser than one, right? So this one is lesser than one because of that if this one is lesser if this beta t is lesser than uh, zero what would happen is that uh, if, if this is a smaller value less negative value this one would be a very higher value one over higher value like uh, this would be greater than one one plus one two it is greater than two that means one over something greater than 2 that means it is lesser than 0.5 right 
that is for the negative case right uh, this is some mathematics right yeah. if you are don't clear that much you can just uh, read it again right you will understand right this is small mathematics but you don't need to uh, need this kind of mathematics too much right if we are understand that's okay if you don't still it's okay right so beta t is no i try so this is the values that we calculate in the linear regression right? this is what this is how we make predictions with logistic regression if the positive case yeah the fx is greater than 0.5 we take beta t x is greater than or equal to zero. Negative case, we take beta Tx is lesser than zero. This is beta Tx, right? Beta zero plus beta one x one, beta two x three, beta n x three. And this one is greater than or equal to zero. This is positive, right? Otherwise, it is negative. Let's see, this is how we use this hyperplane as a classifier. Right. So in this case, we have taken uh, an example with two independent variables, x1 and x2. So when you have two independent variables, suppose the data are uh, distributed like this positive and the negative data sample and this is the decision boundary right represented by z is can be represented by beta 0 plus beta 1 x1 plus beta 2 x2 right so this is these are the axis this is the decision boundary The same boundary means the hyperplane that is or the straight line that is separating these two classes, red classes and red class and blue class. Or if you substitute the value uh, in either side of this yellow line or this decision boundary, you will find that uh, when you uh, substitute the value somewhere here like uh, like 0 0 somewhere here right 0 beta 1 plus 0 beta 2 something so this would be 0 and this it would be beta 0 right so it would be somewhere here right? so it, and because this uh, suppose beta 0 is a negative one if we take so in that case you would find that uh, this said would be negative right that means this should when this said this negative value the class would known as the negative class right so when you substitute some values that are they are the data point is located somewhere here you substitute some x1 values and x2 values here you will find that the Z is greater than zero, right? So in this case, uh, you can find that uh, with this decision boundary, you can, uh, so actually this is equal to zero, right? So this is the, so this is the equation, right? So I have forgotten to write it. Uh, so Suppose this is the decision boundary equation. In this case, you can find that uh, using this specification formula, you can, when you have a new data point somewhere here, you can find the x values and the y values and substitute in this formula. And you can find whether by identifying whether this z is greater than zero or lesser than zero. You can find whether that data point is a positive value or negative value. In this case, it is positive value, right? So that is how we use this logistic regression to 
make prediction so once you have found the beta values beta 0 beta 1 beta 2 and you have once you have defined this model you can substitute values for x values and you can find whether the z is greater than 0 or lesser than 0 and make prediction whether it is positive or negative that is how this binary classifier works right okay now let's see now in so in the case of logistic regression actually you can uh, use apply uh, polynomial values for x values as well right so in the the linear regression the latter part we have discussed about um, polynomial regression right in that case we have substituted x values and y x values with some polynomials of the x value right so instead of using x2 we can use x1 square similarly in this uh, logistic regression also you can substitute uh, x values with some polynomials of x1 right in this case we have substituted x1 and x2 with x1 square and x2 square and then so you know right so x1 square x2 square that this format represents a uh, kind of a circle right so with this circle also you can uh, predict values whether they say is greater than zero when they say is greater than zero we can take it as positive samples when they say is lesser than zero we can take it as negative samples so we can classify the data points and then blue values blue classes using this uh, using this decision boundary it is a non-linear decision boundary because we have used uh, polynomials instead of uh, x values directly into the uh, into this z formula into this z value right when you calculate in this z value we have used x one square and x2 square instead of x1 x2 if we have used x1 x2 you will get a line like this because you have used this uh, squares you get a non-linear decision boundary where yeah, now you can classify non-linear relationships uh, in the classes so with the linear boundary you can never classify these two blue and red classes but with this uh, non-linear decision boundary you can classify right and this is the cost function for binary logistic regression so what is the cost function the cost function the error right so error per uh, iteration or that means when you do the gradient descent you calculate the uh, an error for a single data point that is known as the loss so for a single data point what is the error we call it as the loss and by adding all of these losses for all the data points we call it as cost right then we have discussed this in the last week right and the loss function for logistic regression is defined as lfx they are lfx or lfx y right so it's the relationship between f fx and y right that means that when the y values are also given because it's a label data set so if y values are one uh, we will we should use minus log fx if y value is zero so this is for a binary logistic regression right because there are binary values y can be either one or y can be zero if y is one we should use log fx y is zero we should use uh, sorry minus log fx and y zero we should use minus log one minus fx 
This is the binary logistic regression loss function. How this comes? How did we derive this uh, log function? Okay, that is something that we are not going to discuss. Right? Uh, we have uh, discussed a little bit about how we actually we haven't discussed about how the how we get the mean square errors, right? Why we are using mean square errors? But we said that that is the best uh, cost function to be used for linear regression. For the logistic regression, mean square errors should not be used because that should not go to a log to a global minimum. So we I will explain what is global minimum, right? So for the, just now, just understand that. Uh, for the logistic regression, this is the loss function that we are going to use. It is not the mean square error. We are going to use this loss function. That means for y values that which are uh, equal to one, we use minus log fx. For y values that are equal to zero, we are using minus log one minus fx. This can be uh, represented in a different way a different format using this one. In here, we multiply the minus log fx with y value, right? So if y is one, this one would be y. This, this one would be one, and this term would be minus fx, eh? minus log fx. And this term, so minus log one minus fx is there, right? And it is multiplied by this, one minus one term. So when the y is one, one minus one is zero. This term will get will go to zero. This this in y is one, this term will go to minus log f x is this term, right? When y is equal to zero, what happens is that uh, when y is zero, this term will go to Zero, and this term because y is zero, one only y one is there. Minus log one minus f x, minus log one minus f x. Then y is zero. So the same expression, the same relationship is expressed in a different way, right? Instead of expressing it to conditions, we can express it, explain it with in a single line using this technique. Right? This is for binary logistic regression. Remember, right? This is the loss function for binary logistic regression. For calculating the cost function, right? what is the cost function? J beta. What is the cost function? Cost function means addition of all the losses for all the data points. Right? For, a, for a data point, the error is known as loss. For all the data points, we call it as the cost. And so what we do is we add all the loss, fun, loss values and take the average. Right? And now the j beta or the cost function would be like we replace this LFX, the loss function, with this value yeah, minus log fx minus y, 1 minus y log 1 minus fx. This is the cost function for binary logistic regression. Right? Like we use the uh, cost function of mean square errors, here we are using uh, logistic. This is known as the uh, cross entropy, binary cross entropy loss. Right? So I don't know whether we have mentioned it. I think I have stated it somewhere inside. So this is known as the binary cross entropy loss. Cross entropy cost actually, right? Because we had all the, for all the data points and take the average. This cost function is convex, right? So that is the most important thing 
in this logistic regression cost function. Uh, in the mean square error, we said that the mean square errors follow a this uh, this hyperbolic curve. Yeah, this has only a single minimum. Uh, when we have this J beta, right? You can't remember, right? So when we are changing the beta values, the last week we have discussed that uh, we will have some minimum cost values. This is what and what this is what we are going to find with gradient descent, right? But uh, because there is only uh, one minimum point, this is known as the global minimum or the global minimum, right? That is for the linear regression. So the last week, we, what we were discussing was about linear regression, right? So we were using uh, mean square errors as the uh, as the cost function, as the cost, right? And we were trying to find the minimum value of this cost. And we found that there's only one minimum value and we can find it. And this is the global minimum. But in some machine learning algorithms, right? In, if you have, and also if you have used some other cost function, you may find some other Uh, relationships j beta I have with beta value we can have we may have multiple minimum values right suppose that we have started from here and with gradient descent we come to this point and we come to the come to this point as the minimum point so we reduce the we go to the, to the way we are the gradient is reducing and we find the latest least cost where the cost is not reducing and we find find that this is the least cost point but actually this is not the uh, least cost point in the whole formula in the whole function this is the real point where the cost is minimized so this is known as a local minimum because uh, this is uh, the local value which is a minimum value, local minimum value, but when it comes, when you take the whole function globally, this is the global minimum. When you want to find the solution, you have to find the global minimum, but not the local minimum. Because of that, uh, we should always use a, uh, this kind of convex function find the global minimum whenever possible, right? For the linear regression, we have this mean square error as the cost function, and this gives a global minimum. For the binary logistic regression, if we have used this mean square errors, we will get something like this, not exactly like this, but something like, which has many local minima, and a global minima, we should not uh, find be able to find the local minima. Because of that, we have to use this uh, new cost function, which is known as binary cross entropy uh, cost. Right. So this binary cross entropy uh, cost function is convex, or it has or mat like this as a curve like this where you can find the minimum value because of that reason we have to use this uh, ugly cost function instead of mean square errors right so how we are not going to prove why how this function is coming uh, how this uh, cost function is proved and how the mean square for cost function is proved and so on. What we are going to do is we just have to understand, we have to remember that this is how it is, right? Okay, now let's move into the 
multi class logistic regression. In the earlier case, what we have discussed was about binary logistic regression. We are there or for the cases of binary uh, classification problems, right? In the binary classification problems, we could use logistic regression where you can uh, have a uh, nonlinear relationship in between two values, positive values and negative values. And with this uh, logistic function or the sigmoid function, you can do the uh, classification in between these two classes. But how about multiple class scenario? So this is known as the multi-class logistic regression. Right? You need some kind of multi-class logistic regression to do it. Surely, mm, that means when you have multiple Y classes or Y categories, you can't use uh, logistic regression, then you would have to use some other technique. Right? But fortunately, uh, there are ways, there are two ways known as uh, one versus all, uh, one versus rest, uh, one, not one, not one versus all, but one, one versus one. So this is I think wrong. one versus one and one versus to remember let you know right so and one versus rest so in this case what we do is we can use a binary classifier right and uh, in the first case with one versus one what we do is we for example, uh, suppose now you have three classes, three data classes, one uh, represented by circles, others are uh, with triangles, and others are you can represent it with squares. In the case of uh, these are circles, right? Okay. So when you want to classify these two classes, three data classes, there are three classes, right? How to classify it? We can use one way is to use a uh, multi-class classifier. Yeah, you can classify it like this. Directly you can classify. It. But the other ways uh, you can use uh, wait a minute. And the other one is you can use a one to one classifier. One to one classifier means you can use uh, a classif binary classifier to classify between first this class and this class. You draw a line. Uh, in between this class and this class, you draw a another classifier that is one one versus one, right? And you then you classify use a binary classifier to again to classify in between these two classes. Something like this. So using these, now you have three classifiers. You have uh, solved three classifiers. Using these three classifiers, you can actually make a prediction. That is one versus one. And uh, one. and there's another thing called one versus rest. In the case of one versus rest, what we do is that, uh, what we do is we are going to Uh, for example, if we are going to use this, for example, if you want to classify this one, we are going to classify th this class with the rest of the classes, with these two classes. We are doing making a classifier. And again, 
we are going to uh, classify with this class against these two classes in row classifier. So okay. and again another classifier like this. And using these three classes, uh, what we can do is we we find the probabilities or the confidence, and we find which has the highest one, and we select which one is the solution. So that is how we use three classifiers, right? And use uh, three binary classifiers and use them together to do the multi-class classification. Right. And uh, in the advantage of using one versus all is that you can use any uh, binary classifier because uh, there are many, many techniques of, of implementing a binary classifier. The logistic regression is only one of them, right? So you can have some other classifier like support vector, uh, machine classifier, and so on. And you can use uh, many of them, right? And actually, you can combine them uh, as well, right? So to uh, classify the in a multi-class scenario without using a direct multi-class classifier. So in this case, uh, when you are using the, that kind of uh, binary classifiers, uh, they can be used parallelly, right? Because you are classifying, you are uh, training each of the classifier independently. Because of that, you can uh, do parallel processing. And if you have enough hardware, you can do it faster, right? And, uh, but uh, the it is not a generic form of uh, logistic regression. Uh, when it comes to classifying into multiple classes. Right? So instead of using one versus one and one versus all, uh, what we have to do is we have to use a, uh, a actual uh, generic form of logistic regression, uh, which is known as a softmax classifier. So uh, in the in the soft in the logistic regression we use uh, logistic function or the sigmoid function, but in the softmax classifier uh, we use a generic form of sigmoid function is known as the softmax function for uh, having for handling the case where there are multiple classes instead of a single class, right? The sigmoid function or the logistic function can handle the binary classification problems because it can have only two classes. But when there are multiple classes, three or four or five or in number of classes, it cannot be gener generified. Uh, you can use one versus all and one versus or one versus one, or you can use a this uh, generic implementation of the logistic function, which is known as the softmax function for the classification, multi-class classification. And now let's see what is this softmax function, right? So you may have seen that uh, in the, uh, so in the earlier, what we have discussed was that uh, this unit step function is approximated with the logistic function, right? Because the unit step function was not differentiable or it is, its slope is not defined in all the points so that you can use gradient descent for uh, finding its solution. Because of that, we have used logistic regression. Similarly, when there are multiple classes, the best option is using the max function, right? For example, if you have uh, different, different functions, right? Uh, different, different x values. 
suppose no, this one is the value that you should select. So this one should have value one and all the other values should be zero. This one and this is zero. This is the max function, right? So the max function also has the same max function also suffers with the same problem like the unit step function. Right? So when one particular class is having the value one, and when all the other classes are having the value of zero. So there is no continuous, uh, you can't uh, change the values little by little using the gradient descent to come to the optimum solution because either you have to make this one or make it, make it zero and make some other class one or you have to make, keep the, this class one and keep all the other classes zero. When it comes to max function, right? So this is how we implement the max function, right? So this is the maximum class. So the, the, for the maximum class, we can keep it its value as one. For all the other values, we can keep the value. We should keep the value as zero, right? So this max function also suffers the same problem as we have discussed in the logistic in the unit step function. So because of that, uh, instead of using this uh, max function or the maximum function. Uh, we can use some smooth curve, right? Or smooth, or also known as soft function, soft max function. That is actually what we call as soft max function, right? So, like we have used a logistic function instead of uh, instead of function, we can use soft max function instead of max or the maximum function. That is the idea how this uh, of using softmax function. So the softmax function would be uh, having a different uh, value, something like this. So when all the times, uh, all the other classes will have some value not zero and this the selected class will have a very high value but not one all the other classes will have some value very low value but not zero that is the idea of the softmax function right when you want to have uh, uh, have some value so actually this is not a i don't mean that this one is uh, yeah so this one these classes are continue, continuous. So it should also be something like this, right? So because these are classes, it should be something like this, right? But these are not, not all the classes. None of the classes are exactly zero. None of the classes are exactly one. Because of that, you there are some room for the gradient descent to change its value so that uh, it can learn from the uh, gradient differences. And that is why we can use softmax function for training a machine learning model with gradient descent. Okay. So what is this uh, softmax function? This is the softmax function, right? This is the softmax function, right? how it is calculated so when you have some x values right, what it does is we take this x value to the power of e e is some is the known as the tubular tubular number right so two point something and we take we take the power of euler's number with the value of each of the uh, dimension, each of the value, right? And we 
add them together and then we they, that is taken as for the de denominator and for that particular dimension we take it to the e to the power take that particular value to the e to the power and divide by the sum of the e to the powers of all the dimensions that is what is done by the softmax function just uh, try to understand that so you are given x values right so this is i is the dimension that we want to uh, predict predict means uh, x, x the dimension that we are going to get from the softmax function so what happens is for all the dimensions we take the uh, e to the powers and add them and divide with sum from the uh, value of e to the power value of this particular dimension. So if we want to find xi, we take xi to the power of e and divide by the uh, xi to the powers of all the dimensions, not only i, but uh, 0, 1, 2, 3 to n, right? For all the values, so here we take it as j, for, that is for the that is n is for the all the dimensions. For all the dimensions, we uh, calculate this. Uh, we take the sum of all the exponentials of this e value, and then uh, divide by by uh, divide this one by the sum of the exponential. So what happens is, so when you take a little larger number, to, when you take the exponential, it would be a very large number, right? So small number will not be amplified that much right so only the very when you take the very the largest number in this dimension will have a very higher value and all the other values will be uh, very low right like uh, equal to zero in this case only one or two on only the largest value will have the will have a higher value uh, which is equal which is near the it should be uh, nearly one right so point nine or something so because this is a ratio between uh, two values so it would be in between the value of softmax would lie in between zero and one right so it would not Exactly go to the zero and exactly not not go to the exact value of one either, but uh, it would range in between. But uh, there are on there would be only one value that is basically a one value, right? Would be having a very high value, and the other values would be significantly lower or near the value of zero. And that is the function of of max function right? so this is an example suppose now you have this input vector i think you can see it right so let me take another color right so so this is the input vector these are the dimensions right this has five dimensions uh, so one is 1 1.3, 5.2, and 2.2, 0.7, 1.9. So generally these values are uh, not that varied, right? So this is largest value is 5.1, the smallest value is 0. 0.7, right? So not that much. They don't have not that much difference, right? So they are different, but not that different. But once we pass it through the softmax function, what happens is only the 5.1 which is which has the largest value will be amplified to 0.9 right the smallest value which is 0.7 will be reduced to 0 0.01 right all the other values like 1.3 would be 0 0.03 0 0.2 and the 2.2 will even even the 2.2 it is generally half of the 
this value with move to 0 0.05 while this one while 5.1 is like 0.9 2.2 has moved to 0 0.05 right 1.1 has moved has moved to 0 0.02 right so this is this is how it is discriminating the values of this vector once we have passed it through the softmax function right this is uh, this is why it is almost same as the max function so if you have applied the max function what, will, what should be the value so with the, this is the max value it should be I mean, this value should be one and the other value should be zero right if we have applied the max function this is for max right but uh, because this is not differentiable, we have used the approximate version of this max function, which is the soft max function. Because of that, uh, this only this one value would be nearly one, this 0.9, and the other zero values would be like 0 0.02, 0 0.05, 0 0.01, 0 0.02, and so on. Right, so now this is this is differentiable. So this can be used to uh, find the to uh, this can be applied with gradient descent to find the optimum value, right? So the difference between uh, logistic regression and this one is that uh, this can have a multiple beta vectors, right? Why is that? So the, uh, in the earlier case, we said that in the logistic regression, we said this the because this because logistic regression is a binary classification problem. There's only one we said right? that means uh, we said can be only one or zero. But in this case, there are multiple classes. Right? Suppose we have k classes, right? Because there are k classes, we should have beta k t. That means k beta vectors that has to be that have to be multiplied with x because of that what happens uh, now say now this is the this k is the index of the class right? there should be there can be multiple classes more than two right so this k represents the number of the index of this class and the beta k is the vector relevant to that particular k class and it has to be multiplied with dot product, product it, take the dot, dot product of with the x vector and it will result in, result this uh, z vector right but uh, there are many so not z vector z value right so because there are many several uh, z values relevant to each of the class it's like suppose that suppose now you have three values, uh, three selections, right? You get the you get different linear combinations, right? And then we apply it here, right? So now we apply it to different so, so this is for class one. This is for this is the option for class two. This is the option for class three. Right? Only one of the class will be one, nearly one, like 0 0.9, and the other classes will be very low, very, very low, right? 0 0.01, 0 0.03, and so on. Right? Here we need multiple beta vectors to implement this softmax regression right and because there are multiple classes the predicted value is also or the estimated predicted value can have also several values right because there are different classes because it's the, it's the, because of this multiple classes there are multiple k values that means for each of the classes, there can be different different y values, 
So the predicted y value is we know, right? Predicted y value is represented by y hat. And there can be several y hat values. And for each of the class, for the class k, the predicted uh, y value is represented by this value, right? So we take the addition of all the, so we, first we take the e to the power of zk, right? Which is resulted from this one. And we can have multiple beta values. Z1, this is Z2, this is Z3, something like this, right? We can put the pass selection. This one to this one, this one to this one, this one to here, right? So this is decided by the softmax regression. And this is the loss function of uh, softmax regression, right? And uh, that means uh, because we have multiple classes, it is a bit difficult, right? And the host function is also a bit complex because instead of using the two classes, like in the binary classification problem, you can have multiple. So this should be subscript, right? Subscript type. So when i y i is equal to k, that means when the uh, when at this particular uh, class only that is multiplied by this identity vector and let me uh, take the value of this uh, cost with the log fun log value and then they are added together right so now there are you can see there are two sums for uh, Finding the because there are multiple classes as well, right? So this uh, addition represents the uh, sum of all the classes, and this is for sum of all the values, right? That is the cost function. This is the this is the cost function, or known as the cross entropy loss, or the cost cross entropy cost actually, right? Uh, it's not actually lost. This is cost entropy. Cost of of max regression. Right now, this is the end of today's theory part. I think uh, you may think this is too much theoretical, but. Uh, this is required because not because uh, we like uh, these theories because uh, I understand in this logistic regression is very important when you uh, learn the neural networks right because uh, actually a neural network is a collection of logistic regressions in basic terms right so instead of logist now there are different different uh, little bit uh, different versions of this regression, this binary classif classifier, but uh, in the old, your old way, this is the basic building block of a neural network. So I am not going to explain it um, in detail how it happens, but uh, I said that uh, when you have uh, multiple inputs x1 x2 xn and and multiply with the beta values beta 1 beta 2 and beta n and you have a bias like beta 0 
and then you apply the logistic function right now you get the y value this whole thing represents one neuron in a neural network we call it as single perceptron in a neural network uh, we are not going to discuss all anything, but uh, it is very important to understand uh, the theories behind this, uh, log this logistic regression to uh, understand the neural networks and how it, uh, because uh, neural network is a com combination of many, many, so they are combined to get there as a single layer and there are several layers and there are different different ways they are organized. So this is the basic building block of a neural network. So that is why it is important to learn logistic regression more than a simple binary classifier. And that is the end of today's session. If you have any questions, you can ask. So I will because the today's lesson is finished. So, so next we will be moving to the tutorial session. I think it's better to stop the recording, right? Is it okay? Right. So let's stop the recording and we will move to the tutorial session.